guys, welcome to another one of my videos. How are you? Hope you're all having a good day so far and if you're not, I hope that it gets better. So today in this video, I'm going to be talking about how I got all my physical conditions. I love being able to do that. <laughs> <coughs> so the first one obviously is cystic fibrosis. I don't know why I did the double... Two words, two words, cystic fibrosis. So as you're aware by now, CF is the um, reason I have all of these conditions because it's such a <coughs> lovely disease. Um, and I think what happened is it got pretty lonely. And so it just decided that I needed, you know, to have other stuff so it could have friends. So that that's, that, that's what I'm going with. So we have arthritis and osteoporosis. Yes, both of them. <laughs> so with CF, we struggle to take in all the uh, vital minerals, vitamins and proteins from foods. We struggle with malabsorption. Um, because of this, it affects our bones and joints. Arthritis in CF is also referred to as CF-related arthropathy arthropathy, I think I said that right, and it affects around 5-10% to 10 of people with cystic fibrosis. I personally have arthritis in my neck, shoulders and hands. Yay! <laughs> now, osteoporosis is a lot to do with the issues absorbing vitamin D, um, as vitamin D is the one that helps to give your bones calcium. This, in conjunction with chronic chest infections, uh, which causes our bodies to produce antibodies, which for an unknown reason go into attack mode. And when they do that, they attack all of our joints as well as what's going on in our body. Obviously they don't do it very well because you know, we need antibiotics to help them do it. So they're a little bit misguided. And even after 30 years, they haven't learned how to do the job. So I'm thinking they're a little bit simple. Blah. And I personally have osteoporosis in my hips and knees, hence why I use a walking stick and I will also use a wheelchair, not just because I find it difficult to get about for my lungs and stuff, but also because I get bad pains in my legs. Next we have scoliosis. So although there is actually a limited amount of data on uh, scoliosis and CF, it is actually a really common thing for people with CF to get um, or be born with <clears throat> and they think that this might be a lot to do with malabsorption and the issues with growth in the bones. Calcium deficiency. As you can imagine, being that we don't absorb all the good nutrients from our food, um, calcium being one of those minerals, we become really deficient and due to constant chest infections and inflammation and malnutrition. And although we are given supplements to kind of aid in getting enough vitamin D back into our bodies, this isn't always enough to make us perfect. Liver cirrhosis and fatty liver. Now both of these conditions are generalized under CF related liver disease. And around 40% of people with cystic fibrosis will have some sort of liver issues. CF causes problems with the liver being able to do its job correctly. It causes problems with its ability for the bile to work correctly. The cells cannot transfer chloride well enough, which causes the bile ducts to become sticky, inflamed and irritated. Now, cirrhosis is irreversible and it is a very severe form of liver scarring. It's essentially the exact same disease as what alcoholics get in the last stages of their alcoholism. And this is because the liver tissue becomes hard and it causes pressure on one of the blood vessels flowing into the liver. I mean, you know, I even tried eating liver as a kid to try and repair mine. It didn't work, but, you know. <laughs> GERD, as in G-E-R-D. GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Got it right, yes. <laughs> Which is also known as acid reflux disease and is caused by the stomach acid rising up into the esophagus. 
and causing burning and scarring. There are a few reasons that this can be caused. Um, the constant coughing and the pressure sort of pushing the stomach acid up into the esophagus, um, overinflated lungs putting uh, pressure on the diaphragm, and also the opening between the stomach and the esophagus uh, can weaken. Asthma, because you know, one lung disease wasn't enough. Um, so the diagnosis between asthma and CF can be difficult and it is normally based upon a few things. So one would be a spirometric test, uh, which is how well your small airways function under pressure. Two would be how well you respond to bronchodilators, which uh, is normally an inhaler or a nebulizer and you breathe that in and how well your small airways respond to it. And number three, exercise testing. And this is actually a pretty valuable diagnostic test between CF and CF asthma because the two illnesses respond differently to the exercise. With asthma, the lung function after exercise takes around 30 to 60 minutes to go back to normal, whereas with CF, this can take much, much longer. Diabetes. Now, diabetes in CF is also known as CF-related diabetes, or CFRD. Now, really, we are neither type 1 or type 2. They consider us type 1 and a half because we share characteristics with both types of diabetes. So, with CF, you are born with a reserve amount of insulin, and over years, that gets used up. Now, our pancreas doesn't not work completely, it still has some function, but the uh, entryway that releases the insulin is clogged with a lot of sticky mucus, so the insulin finds it very difficult to get out. So although it will release some, it simply doesn't release enough. So we do need to use insulin, but we only need to use it every time we eat. We don't need to use it first thing in the morning, lunch and noon. If we don't eat, we don't need it. Um, and it can be uh, Levomir, which is normally used for feeds or overnights, and uh, Nova Rapid, uh, for me personally, which is the quick acting, which is what I would have before I eat. Because, you know, CF never gives us anything that's just straightforward. It likes to kink and throw in its own little, you know, type one, nah, type two, nah. We're gonna give you one and a half. <laughs> and finally, chronic pain. I mean, after all the conditions I've listed, is it really that surprising that pain comes into play there somewhere? Let's be fair. <laughs> and I'm very aware that from looking at me, I do not look in pain. And it is a comment that I get quite often from people is, you look fine, you know, are you really in pain? Things like that, are you, is, you know, is it in your head? And the thing is, out of all my conditions, pain is absolutely the most difficult to deal with. And I am in pain constantly. I'm in pain right now. I'm in pain right now. My back, my hips, my legs are all hurting. I can really feel them. And there's never a break. Even when I sleep, I will wake up several times throughout the night because of pain. You know, as well as lung pain from infections, lots of coughing, inflammation, my body just aches and it aches all the time. And people seem to have this idea that pain relief completely removes pain from someone's body, when in actual fact that's not true. Pain relief can help and it certainly does, it just helps to make it more controllable, but it doesn't remove it. You know, without my pain relief, I would be in far greater pain than I am right now. So it's important that I have it because I know that although I hurt, it could be worse. And pain is very exhausting. It is tiring for the body and the mind to consistently battle with a body that hurts. And more so when you want to be able to do things, you want to be able to go out with friends, you want to be able to have days out, you just wanna be able to enjoy yourself. But you have to weigh up the options because it's like, okay, say I wanna to go to town, right? The day before, I need to rest the day of town, and then I need to rest when I get home, and then the day afterwards, agony, agony. And you have to weigh up the choices, but the thing is, although pain is painful, incredibly painful, 
it's important to me that I try not to waste my time sitting at home. That if the opportunity arises to get out of my house, I have to do it, you know? And sometimes the memories are worth the pain that follows. One of the biggest issues that people with pain struggle is the disbelief, is the people not believing you could be in that much pain all the time and still smile and still laugh. But you can. You would be surprised when you live with something for a very long time, what you will adapt to and live with and just cope with. You know, there are days where I cry. Absolutely sob, absolutely. And there are days when I say to Lucas, I can't, this is too much, it's too much today. But with those days comes these days where I go, right, no, April, get up, get dressed, do your makeup, feel good. You deserve to feel good. <clears throat> but disbelief is the biggest struggle and it is the most disheartening. Um, you know, I always say that if you could see pain on someone's body the way that someone could feel it, you would probably be horrified. And so if someone tells me something hurts, I believe them. I am not the person to say, that didn't hurt because it didn't hurt me. Or, you know, stop being dramatic. Because who am I? I'm not that person. I'm in, not in their body. I don't have their pain threshold. I don't feel what they feel. So if someone says to you they're in pain and someone says to you that that hurt them or anything like that, please believe them. It's so important when you are a chronic pain sufferer that they are made to feel believed because it really is so debilitating. Just don't make them feel like they're liars. So I hope you enjoyed this video and as always, any questions, please don't be afraid to ask. I really am an open book and I really don't mind. I hope you enjoyed the video because, you know, I enjoyed making it. Please remember to like and subscribe and remember, be brave, be amazing, be you and keep shining. All my love, Pretty Pop.